come here to the waters, you that hath no money, come and buy and eat. Come and buy wine and milk without money and without price. And then he says, wherefore you do you spend money for that which is not bread, and you labor for that which satisfieth not. Hearken diligently unto me, eat that which is good, let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear, come unto me and hear, and your soul shall leave. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Now, hold it in verse 3. It says, incline unto me, verse 3, uh, incline your ear unto me, come unto me and hear. Now, let's look at Acts chapter 14 and verse 6. Come unto me and hear. Acts 14 and verse 6. It says, there were of it uh, that fled to Lystra, Debbie, and all of that. Now, verse 7. It says, there they preached the gospel. Verse 8. It says, and there sat a certain man. Now, we're talking, come and hear. Impotent in his feet, being crippled from his mother's womb, who never had walked. He had never had the experience of walking in his life from his mother's womb. Verse 9, what changed it? The same heard Paul speak. The same heard Paul speak. It says, why do you labor for that which satisfieth not? You spend your money on that which is not bread. Come unto me, he said, and hear. Incline your ear unto me because he wants to produce in you through that listening ear the kinds of works he produced in that man who was at Lystra who was born crippled from his mother's womb, had never worked. What changed his entire life, right, was that he heard Paul speak and he heard something. And that caused his countenance to change. And Paul saw that and called for a prophetic action and his entire life was reversed in a moment because he heard so he's telling us something about hearing. Now let's go back again to Isaiah 5.3. All right? Isaiah 5. Many things to say. It says, And your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. In other words, as you are listening to him, you will enter into a secret covenant with God. Are you following what I'm saying here? In other words, as you are hearing God, let's say you've labored and labored and labored at work and labored in your business, nothing has happened. He says now, you've spent your strength, come and listen. As you are listening to him, he will enter into a covenant with you concerning that thing. And then he goes on and says, even the sure mercies of David. Verse 4, he says, I have given him as a witness a leader and a commander to the people. Now, what will be the outcome after you have heard? Thou shalt call a nation. Which means, after you have heard and your soul is full, you will open your mouth, and there is a prophetic utterance now, and you will call a nation that you didn't know. In other words, you will call for to make it clear. That is not the arrangement of man. It is a nation that you don't know, you will call forth. And nations that knew thee not, verse 5, nations that knew thee not shall come running unto thee because the Lord thy God, for the Holy One of Israel, he hath glorified thee. Now, there are two systems we said last week you can operate in. There's the system where the wind is blowing, Jesus comes in that principle of dominion. And he is walking on water. And then Peter says, bid me to come. And he comes. And he is also walking on water based on what he had. That's all that happened. 
All right, Jesus was dominating and he said, beat me. And he heard that and he came walking on water. And then after he looked at the winds, they were boisterous. And he began to sing and he cried out saying, Lord, all right, help me or save me. And the Lord pulled him out when he was sinking. So you can have, all right, two systems here. One where people are playing and playing, now get this, praying and praying and saying, God, do this, God, do this for me, God, do this, and they are praying. Or the system here of the prophetic, where people go to God in prayer over that particular thing. And as they are praying, they are asking God, Grant me eyes that will see the wondrous works out of thy word and ears that will hear what you are saying about this situation. And they will open up their heart to God and start feeding on the scriptures concerning that situation. They come to a place where they enter into what is called the fatness of their souls and now rise up and begin to make prophetic utterances, calling forth, all right, those things. In other words, you can have a person who says, just an example now, I need a job, God send me the job. God send me the job, God send me the job. And somebody else and the person picks, I want to work in this company, I want to do this and all that. And then they're praying, God, God, I'm telling you, I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying about it. Or somebody else says that now, God, all right, I'm coming to meet you here because you are a God from the beginning who will employ the work of my, employ my hands in productive labor. There is a place you have prepared for me, all right? So first of all, in this world, I will have tribulation, but I'm of good cheer. You have overcome there. Oh, so I am coming with thanksgiving and praying that show me the prophetic scriptures concerning this situation that I am in. And you begin to behold the face of God in the scriptures and words are quickened on the inside of you and then you rise up in that place of meditation there and say according to that which is written that I have seen I call forth this job I have seen written in the scriptures forth in the name of Jesus the person who will link me to that job I call you into my life and in a short while they get into something and something manifests so there are people that sit, feed, and prophesy. There are people that are praying and begging God to do something. Are you following what I'm saying here? Two systems. Jesus operated that system where he stayed there and heard from God, which means faith comes by hearing but and hearing the word of God, but that hearing God's word comes in through prayer. So you spend time in prayer saying that my soul will be fed. And it says, being fed there, all right, which means if any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. That's the inflow, and then out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. That is the outflow from his belly. That is the last feast that we're getting into, which is a flood tide of prophetic utterance where people, the same way Jesus spoke to the storm and spoke to the wind, where God will feed the hearts of people and lay the deposits there and they are fat within their soul and they are releasing things into the atmosphere and things are reacting and changing and doing stuff for them there. So that is the system, all right, that we are looking at, all right, in this series here. So there is one that says, God, you know, I'm trying to do this, do this. And there's another that sits there, spends time praying there. And as they're praying, the Holy Spirit, as we said, is going through everything that they know in scriptures, looking for scriptures to quicken unto them. And then he says, go back to the Bible and read. We have not yet gotten the scriptures. And then that's why he says in Isaiah 34, he says, take ye out the book of the Lord and read. He said, not one of them shall fail. Not one shall want a mate. For my mouth has commanded, my spirit will gather those things unto you. Okay. Now, if his spirit is going to gather, he told us in the book of Luke, he said, I send prophets to you, I send people to you that I might gather. In other words, to gather these things, he has to send people into your life to cause the manifestation of that. You call forth for those people, something happens in your interaction with them, and manifestations start. 
Do you get what I'm saying? I, I could get down from this pulpit and say that is the message and God will honor what I just said. Because that is where people need to get to. From a place of begging God to do something to allowing the Holy Spirit feed their heart. When the Bible says fatness, you know when it says and the, the yoke shall be broken and the body shall be lifted by reason of the anointing and the yoke shall be broken. The word anointing there is that same Hebrew word as fatness. In other words, when you feed fat, you break yokes and burdens are lifted. Okay. So let's get in something here. Let's look at Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. So what happens is you are quickened, all right, on the inner side of yourself as you are there meditating on scriptures there. Things are being quickened, all right, on the inner side of you. I mean, when Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will. That word ask there is actually the word demand, all right, what you will and it shall be done. Which means the asking place is when you abide in him and you ask and then he supplies remas or he quickens things to you. And from that position of quickening things, you start making demands on this earth and it's done unto you, my father who is in heaven. Okay. So, Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, we see God making a declaration. And God said, let us make man in our own image. And after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over the earth, and over every creeping thing. Now, God spoke, and many of us think, and this is erroneous, that after God spoke, then there was manifestation on the outside. He said, let the grass come forth, and grass began to come forth. All right? He said, let this happen, and everything began to do that. When he said those things, it was, I'll show you, it was the image that was formed on the inside of him. There was no physical manifest appearance yet, but it was established in him. Now, let's see when God began the creation, all right, in Genesis 2. Now, we don't know whether this happened, he said, and did it immediately, all right, or he said, and then later on. All right, he did it. But look at Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. So he didn't say, Let, let's make man our own image, and the man appeared. Do you understand what I'm saying here? He didn't say, let the grass come forth. You see, the, and the grass appeared. Look at what he did. He walked. And the Lord God, now let's go from verse um, 4. Verse, okay. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth. When, the, when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Verse 5. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it what? Grew. If it doesn't grow, that means it hasn't appeared. Do you get what I'm saying? Now, what caused it to appear? For the Lord God had not caused it to do what? Rain. So it was after the rain began to fall that the grass started coming, all those things started coming out. Do you get what I'm saying? Now, because the Lord God had not caused it to rain, put it back up please, all right? And there was not a man to do what? Till the ground. So man was supposed to till the ground. Man wasn't supposed to just talk and things will appear. Are you following what I'm saying here? Work is not a curse. Because the impression we had was that they were just naked in the garden, speaking to things and enjoying life. All right? And how will we get to that day where, you know, when you get to heaven and they give you assignment, you will know that it's not an earthly thing. There are some places that uh, which is what I thought when you die you conquered everything. I know there are some creatures in some places. It's time to go and conquer. Uh, so he gave him the assignment here. I said to till the ground. Now, 
to till. Now, God didn't tell man to do what he didn't do. And there went a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. Now, there's no way I'm going to be able to teach this whole thing. I'm just going to drop some things then. We'll come back next week. And the Lord God did what? Formed man. The word form is different from the word let us make. There are two different Hebrew words. The word make there is like, let us set it as our goal. Let us make this pronouncement so the image is formed on the inside of us. But we still have to go out to cause what we have imaged within to be made manifest on the outside. Do you get what we're saying here? So it's an image that is within. And now, that's a major aspect of work. Because work begins in your mind. Work begins in your imaging things. And you running through the entire process in your imagination. And working out all the details in your imagination. All right? So you imagine everything. I mean, so we are having the uh, debate for uh, go back to right away. We've imaged everything uh, arrival of guests, imaged exactly how they are going to walk into their places there, imaged exactly, which means that you run through everything on the image there. And while you are imaging it, let me tell you the kind of detail I'm talking about. All right, because of the con- because of the way in which they have to walk when they are called up to the stage. We have to use, all right, um, um, create a pathway, all right, uh, where we're doing it, a pathway, and, and condole that area away, all right, from people to see while they walk and, and from their uh, green room into the place here. Now, let me show you this will happen. While I was imaging the work, I realized we had to use wooden, all right, sticks here to create the barrier around. And that, all right, when you create that, to be able to put the black cloth, the wooden stick will, will sit this way. You understand? And then the pole comes up here. We'll sit this way. And I image that as they are coming, because they'll be looking up, they can trip on those things. So that thing that is this way has to be done in a certain way where it is clear. You image everything. Based on that, you call up the person doing it. Do it this design. Do it this design. Do it this design. Do you get what I'm saying here? That's the work. That's, you are thinking through on everything. You are thinking through on, on the bank. So when people show up, and it's, as they are showing up, they are trying to do something, they don't understand, all right, how God created man. It should have been imaged. It should have been played over and over. The errors should be corrected on the inside of you so you execute flawlessly. And when you in your execution, you didn't pick up certain things, you note those things in your consciousness, the next time you're coming through, you are not supposed to repeat a mistake. Are you following what I'm saying? That's why you are paid first from the mind down to the body. Do you get what I'm saying? People paid lowest on that value chain are people that are just executing with their body not people that are making as they go up people that are using their minds are the ones that get up there so god bible says let us make man in our own image and after our own likeness and let them have dominion and then he went to two seven and he formed man so god came and formed man and the problem with a lot of people is that they don't want to get their hands dirty so they don't know how to do anything. Now, you follow what I'm saying here? You can't come and talk about uh, leading people if you, haven't, if you haven't ever gotten your hands uh, dirty. When they talk about transgenerational, transgenerational wealth, all right, where companies have been 300 years and they've taken it from, from, from generation to children and all of that, it's because the fathers told they are children that you start from the bottom. And then they told people in that office that, listen, if you treat them and give them any special treatment, you will be fired. Deal with those people here. 
and then they showed them so that they will understand and you will get your hands dirty and you will understand all right what it is and many people just don't want to do that now god came and formed now look at what he did here and formed man from the dust of the ground put it up all right formed man from the dust of the ground and then did what breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul now god formed and breathed now what am i saying what made him after he formed him so unique was i breathed in him the breath of life many people with their hands form things but don't breathe into those things let me just show you all right uh, Ezekiel chapter 37. Let's see what breathe the breath of life is. Ezekiel 37, 1. And the hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me in the valley of dry bones there, full of dry bones. And he caused me to round about and he said, all right, very dry. And then verse 3, he goes on and said, can these bones live? And I answered only thou knowest. And he says, prophesy unto them, O ye dry bones, hear ye what the word of the Lord. Verse 5, it says, Thus said the Lord unto the bones, Behold, I will cause what? Breath. To do what? Enter into you and you shall live. Many Christians have companies without breath. Do you get what we're saying here? Which means that they are not prophesying and putting a life into those things. Okay? They are not putting life they are not prophesying into those things. He says he breathed into it and it became, man became a living soul. Which means it's the breath you put into it that causes it to become something. And therefore you understand that what you are doing, an unbeliever has no access to it. And so get that breath is scripture. For all scripture is given by breath. So you go to God in prayer. And in prayer, that is what we're saying. And you go there to hear concerning that entity. And while you are there listening, what comes on the inside of you? Listen, what entered into that man at Lystra healed the man who was born from his mother's womb and couldn't walk. In other words, something can be transferred into you as you stay there hearing the word of God and listening and absorbing it such that if you... Now, the man didn't know that he was supposed to do something. All right, so Paul said, get up. Now, if you now put that thing into entities around you, they become something. So he formed man and breathed into him the breath of life. So it's about going to God, taking up what you have in your hands today. I mean, well, five loaves, Jesus breathed into it. That's why he started multiplying. And what happened there was the goal of Jesus, because this is the way it works, was that it was to it was to use it to feed the multitude. This is where he says he will make a covenant. Because when you are hearing him here, he enters into a covenant. Which means you, you enter into some hidden agreement with God where he says, you see it, I'm opening up this job for you. And this thing or opening up this um, um, contract here for you. And this thing, when you get it, just the same way it took man and put him in the garden. There was a covenant. He says, you can eat of everything, but don't eat of this. The day you eat of this, you shall die. All right? A person says, well, I don't have anything. What do you have? Just a vessel, a, a jar of oil. All right? Go around and borrow, not a few. And bring them. In other words, you, if if you are you enter into a covenant that and the thing did not stop until there were no more vessels. So God says, they said, they are. I mean, someone can start a company, and and God says, look, there are many young people out there 
that are jobless, that require skills or legacy of some sort. And I want to use your, your company as a point of contact to pour into the emptiness of these young people. That's the agreement. So long as you're pouring into the emptiness, and he said to him, he showed him from the beginning. You will pour into these people, you will train them, some will leave and go and start other things. That is the service you are rendering so you don't get angry because it's a covenant you have with God. And it shows you that as they grow, your own will also multiply. So we are talking about, you are coming some secret agreement there. When we say secret agreement, which means God shows you something. So it is not to consume it upon your lust. But it is that, like I talked, is that you have asked according to his will. Which means, what's your will concerning this thing? What's your own intent and purpose? And he shows you. So, anything that is in the hands of anybody, God wants to use it. Whatever anybody has on their hands, God wants to use it, all right, as a point of contact to achieve something eternal on this earth. He just wants people to come and listen to him, just to hear him, to say something to him. And once they hear what he has said to them concerning it, all right, and he opens up and they see that, they, then they begin. So, John 7, 37, the inflow and the outflow. Now, a prophetic action is not a mysterious or weird thing. Because when people say a prophetic action, all right, it, it will feel, well, it's a mysterious thing. Now, where am I going with this? Let me, because of time. Now, you know, the Isaiah 55, 1. We got to verse 5. Remember, God could not do anything until rain began to do what? Fall. Nothing showed up until rain started falling. So, all right, you have to get rain to start falling or else it's going to be very difficult for you, all right, to till any ground if rain is not falling. So, it says in Isaiah 55 and verse 6, it tells us the next verse, Isaiah 55, 6, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is yet near. And then he says, Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God who will abundantly pardon. Let me explain what that scripture is saying. What that scripture is saying, and until you see this, you will think that it's just talking about, and many people think it's this, that it's just saying, you know, sin. And no, that's not what he is talking about. It says, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts higher than your thoughts, and my ways higher than your ways. Let me show you what he is actually saying, because this is what gets you into prophetic stuff. Okay, in Numbers chapter 13, I'm going to show you here. Numbers chapter 12, verse 6 to verse 9. No, no, no. Numbers 12. Um, Numbers 24, verse 13. Numbers 24, verse 13. All right? Now, hear what Balaam said. He said, if Balak will give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the commandments of the Lord to either do good or bad of my own mind. But that which the Lord saith, I will speak. In other words, he said, there are some things that are good. There are some things that are bad. But you can do a good thing, and there's a way that seems right and is good, But that's not God's mind for that particular thing. Now, what you have got to understand is the danger in this is, this is the danger. This is the danger. When God puts the tree that they shouldn't partake of, what did he call it? The knowledge of good and evil. And then left the tree of life. In other words, you are partaking of that tree of knowledge of good and evil if you are just going by your own sheer brilliance in what you think should be done, all right, and going by your sheer brilliance there, and you don't get to the place where is the mind of God. Now, and a lot of times, when he wants to tempt you out of this, and I, I talked about this testimony here, he said, even if Balak fills a house with silver and gold, in other words, I will still check to know what is God's mind before I move. Now, I told a story about, this is what we're talking about, about, and this is why people 
miss God because people don't say things like no brainer and then it sounds good and then they do it. See, as a young lady, she used to intern in church. Her parents, uh, both of them are ministers, but he went to do a course in, 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 um, in, well, in New York. So he's, he's doing a program right now. And he wrote me about a testimony about his daughter who is in Dublin. And she got a job recently at Google as a product manager with a certain pay which was very good. Number one, the pay was very good. Number two, Google is a powerful place to work as a product manager. I mean, you, you are going to shoot up to other things. I mean, that's a powerful platform. But she said, she's 23 years old. She said she had a check in her spirit about taking the job. Now, some other smaller company offered a job which was maybe about half the amount of what to thought was considerably lower than what Google was offering. And she said she had a release to go and do that. If she was following silver and gold, you know, God said there are three ways in which people err. He said, you go the way of Cain, which means you begin to attack. Well, you know, error has entered people. You start attacking people that are more successful in your circle than you. Or you go the way of Belam, which means you are making decisions for material gain. That's your only consideration. He said the things that make a person, all right, be like a wandering star out of orbit. He says you start making that. He said the third is rebellion against constant authority. All right? Now, it's not just for ministry because I taught this one day in ministry and one of the campus pastor called me and said, look, all middle managers in community groups should be taught this principle. This is what is finishing people in their careers. So, you get there's an offer there, and they lure, all right, without any consideration. And when something is good, you tell everybody around, they say, it is what? Good. But there is that which is, all right, highly esteemed by men, but it's an abomination in the sight of God. So, when he says, come and seek me, let the unrighteous forsake his way and his thoughts, he's talking about that place, which means you want to remove all those layers to make sure that. Now, what happened to that lady? She said, her friends went into that Google, people went in and got it. After about six months, they shut down when Google was laid off. Laid off everybody. Those people are without jobs now, and they are promoting her where she was. Now, she will have surpassed what she was earning in Google. I've heard, right, you see now. Now, somebody will say, but where was God when they were laying? You won't know that God. We won't know there was nudging in people's hearts. All right? And that's where you get into what is called a prophetic action. A prophetic action, all right, is an action. It is not weird. It's not mysterious. It is a simply an ac- action under the anointing or unction of the Spirit of God as a step of faith, as an act of obedience that releases the power and the presence of God that causes victory. Prophetic actions are not irrational or weird steps, but they are decisions based on knowledge that lies beyond the scope of human reasoning. In other words, you are taking an action based on knowledge you have received that is beyond the scope of human reasoning. But it's not necessarily just a weird thing. Let me give an example. Acts chapter 11, verse 27 and verse 30. I said, I won't be able to just share something. Acts 11, yeah. He says, in these days came the prophets from Jerusalem. Now, this is a prophetic action they took. Unto Antioch. And there stood up one of them by the name Agabus, and it signified that the spirit, that the spirit, that by the spirit, that there should be great death across the world, which should come to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. And verse 29, then the disciples, every man according, which means it hadn't yet happened. It was what they saw prophetically. Do you get what I'm saying here? But the decision they made was a simple decision. It wasn't a weird, which means people say when we are in prophetic, it means that we tell people to lie down, we are walking upon them, and, you know, we must do weird things. You know, you must, you must take something, I'm hitting your head, I'm, I'm doing something prophetic, and it, look, it's mysterious, you don't understand what I'm doing. Listen, this was a prophetic thing. They saw it ahead of time, right? And it says, well, what do we do here? The Bible says that every man according to be determined to send relief. Now, to somebody who doesn't have that information, He's looking at them in Jerusalem. They are doing well. Why are you sending relief to people that are doing well? Do you get what I'm saying? 
Then after three years, those people have a stop. Which means a prophetic action is simply Noah building an ark. But he wasn't doing something weird. He was doing something based on knowledge that he received, but wasn't apparent to the human consciousness. So, you can see that in faith, saving money might be a prophetic action. You get what I'm saying here? Faith doesn't mean that you are not prepared. In fact, in this, you see, there are two things when it's prophetic. It's either it is foretelling or forthtelling, which means you are calling something forth or you are foretelling, you are telling about the future. Now, what I've been teaching is foretelling, where you speak to things. But there's also foretelling, where you see, where Joseph saw ahead and said the decision to take here is to save. When Moses saw ahead and said, I'm leaving, it didn't make sense to the person who was dealing with that. Are you following what I'm saying here? Now, what you need to understand, prophetic action, therefore, is that that's what he said. He's saying, trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not your own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him. And what he will do is, he will give you information which means direct you to do things. It is what you now do that causes the release of power. Do you, are you following what I'm saying? In all thy ways. So, let me just close by saying this here. Because I knew I wouldn't be able to, but let me just close by saying this. As well. I've been all over the place, but let me finish all over the place too. So everybody should pick what they want. But I want people to understand how, because people say, how do I hear the voice of God? Let me show you how it is opened and how you get into the prophetic there. Now, I've told you the prophetic doesn't mean. Now, when you, there's forth telling, which means you're calling something forth. That's the kind of prophetic action where Moses he wanted to bring a manifestation at that moment. He said, give him instruction. Now, that's a prophetic action now, which means that is forth telling. You want to call something forth. So he said, stretch forth your rod. Tell them to go forward. He parted the Red Sea. That's manifestation. But there are also prophetic actions that have to do with the future. Where he shows you things that are to come and tells you today, start preparing for that day. Where he can show you and say, look, these things are going to happen. Start preparing for that day. Where he could tell somebody and say, there will be a crash in the currency three years before it happens. And says, all of your saving, change it into this currency. So somebody says, why are you doing that? Well, I'm just doing that. All right? And then after three years, something happens and the person's money has quadrupled or it's multiplied. As the thing is, his own wealth is going as prophetic. So, it's not that you are behaving like a weird person. All right? That we are deep and we're weird. Right? Now, well, how do you hear this kind of things? It's one way you hear it. You know, the Bible says, harden not your heart. If you will hear his voice in Hebrews, it says, do, do what? Harden not your heart. Now, let me just show you the depth of dimension of hearing. And this is what God wants of you. Because he tells us, all right, in all thy ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Daniel 11.32 says that they that know their God. You see that word, in all thy ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Is the same Hebrew word that they that know their God shall be strong and they will do exploits. In other words, exploits there means bold actions. They will just get up and say, this is what we're doing, bold. Now you say what? It's a prophetic action. It's coming from knowledge they have received, imparted by the spirit, and they go ahead and do it. So they walk on water. You're going to what's going on. It's a prophetic, all right, action that they're taking. Now, how do you get to that point here? Quickly, I'll just close with this. Numbers chapter 12, verse 6 to 9. Now, look at what, look at what um, um, God was saying to Moses here. Now, Aaron and Miriam came to criticize Moses because of the woman he married. Numbers 12, 6, all right, came to my, because of her. And then he said, hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, somebody I called, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and speak to him in a dream. Now, verse 7. My servant Moses. Now, this is accessible to everybody. Is not so. Why? Because he's what? Faithful in all my house. That is all he said. He said, he's not a prophet. He didn't say he's God's a prophet. He says, faithfulness in my house. Now, look at the next verse. He said, with him will I speak mouth to mouth. 
apparently are not in dark speeches, and the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Which means, with an open face, he will behold as in a glass the glory of the Lord. He says, wherefore you are not afraid to speak against my servant Moses. Now, remember, all he was was faithful in the house. Now, go to Hebrews 3, 1, and you'll see it. He said, that's what makes me speak, all right? Hebrews 3, 1, quickly. All right. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of a profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, even as Moses was what? Faithful in all his house. Verse 3, it says, For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, than much as he that built the house hath more honor than the house. Verse 4, he now says, Every house is built by someone, but he that built all things is God. Verse 5, and Moses verily was faithful in the house as a servant for a testimony of those things which will be spoken after, but Christ as a son over his own house. Whose house are we if we hold fast our confidence and rejoicing in hope firm unto the end? Verse 7. He now says, wherefore, the Holy Ghost said, today, if you will hear his voice, be faithful in temp. He says, look at the next verse. If you are going to get to that place, harden not your heart in the day of provocation as in the day of temptation in the wilderness. In other words, what opens you up to hearing the voice of God and seeing his shape is you being faithful to God when you are tested and you are tried and it didn't work the way you thought it would work and they said listen to me you went there you thought you had got the admission and got the scholarship you were turned down and everything everything crashed you are told one two three people you are about to travel and you are back with us in George and you are rejoicing steadfast in the hope that's where you are going to hear the voice of God and that voice is going to give you, and that's when you take prophetic actions. And then you hear his voice. Anybody who gets angry, anybody who says it didn't work, anybody that comes and says, but I did this, and is angry and hardens their heart and is folding their hands, all right, and all of that, and says, I'm not, then you don't get into that voice place. Do you get what I'm saying here? So how do you get there? What opens you up? That's the only way there. Love you have for God. He says, these things are prepared for them that love me. So you are going to be tested. God is going to test you. You'll be tested with disappointments. You'll be tested, all right, with people treating you. You'll be tested, and he says, it is a test. Every test is a love test. And you go up there, and you worship, and then the voice comes to you, and you know exactly what you're supposed to do. And you start obeying the voice of God. You start doing what God tells you to do. And suddenly the everything now begin, and you are bold. You begin to do exploits and massive things. All right, begin to happen because you open up your heart to Him, and you have worshipped Him. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you for your word. I ask by the power of your Spirit, cause this word to take deep roots on the inside of us, bring forth fruit within our lives. That you grant grace to everyone under the sound of my voice. That going through a time of test who are at the door of your kingdom. Where there is that small still voice they are supposed to hear there. That will turn and change things. Grant them the grace to lift up those heavy hands. And to go back into prayer there with the feeble knees. So that they can hear what you are saying clearly. Concerning their life, their destiny, the things that they are doing, whatever it is, and enter into that massive place of rest in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. It's an anointing service, and um, I was reluctant in my heart, all right, in to, you know, when I said that I struggled with it, but I, I, it was the word that was quickened unto me. Now, I believe, I believe, Every single human being that enters into this earth should at least own a piece of this earth. Do you get what I'm saying? You should point to a territory that belongs to you, even if it's one acre. You can't come to this earth and leave this earth without any form of ownership. Because some people own the earth. Everything is divided somewhere. Are you following what I'm saying? And so it's important that there is some form of ownership. 
So God showed me Psalm 44. It's still favor that we're talking about from verse 1 to verse 3. And this is what I want to anoint all our people out. We have heard with our ears, O oh God, our fathers have told us what work you did in their days in the time of old. All right? And everything that God does in the new, all right, he takes everything in the old and then adds to it. That's the way God operates. Okay? So when he upgrades you, he takes everything. You can't have an upgrade of a phone where it can't do what the lesser, what's the point? So when you upgrade something, it takes all of what was in the past and then adds to it. So if God was doing this in the past, he's still doing it today. Do you get what I'm saying here? Okay. All right? How he did drive out the hidden with the hand and planted them and then afflict the people and cast them out. For they got the land in possession. For they got the land in possession by, sorry, they got not the land in possession by their own sword. Neither did their own arm save them, but thy right hand, thy right arm, and the light of thy countenance, because thou hast had favor on them. So one anoint for favor that that which belongs to you on this earth are portioned to you. That by unusual favor, do you understand what we're saying here? We explain that the riches of glory, when the Bible says the riches, he will supply according to the riches of glory. There's the explanation here. If I am working, let's just assume this phone is a million naira, and I'm working and I'm earning 200,000 naira. My salary cannot buy the phone of one million. Okay? So if I say I'm going to buy this phone of one million, and someone says, how are you going to buy it? And I say, now, this is your inheritance now. And I'll say that, well, my own labor cannot get it. But my father left an inheritance for me. And every year from that inheritance, I get 20 million. I will take the riches of that glorious inheritance. Do you get what we're saying here? Which means every year it produces riches of 20 million. I will take from it to buy the phone. Once you know I have an inheritance, you know I have access to this particular thing. So the riches of your glorious inheritance is separate. Do you get what we're saying here? So favor is one of the riches of your glorious inheritance. Are you following what I'm saying here? And so people can show you favor. And what they say show you favor is they show you land and property. Favor doesn't mean you will not pay for it, but they look at it and say, well, it's 100 million. We'll discount it for you and then break it down for you for the next 15 years to pay. Is that okay? You say, yes, you can enter into the house as owner now and be paying 200,000 and that's it. You got it by what? The light of his countenance. Are you, you get what I'm saying here? All right. So we want to do that, that everybody... All right, so let's get up and put the anointed oil. I hope you have it. All right. Let's place it on our forehead. I declare into the life of every single person under the sound of my voice. According to this word, Psalm 44, quickened unto us this day. I stand upon that rock and declare into your life that the Lord has caused his favor to come upon you concerning landed property. And I call forth that person on the earth who will be that link and show you favor in order for you to access a part of this earth assigned to you through the blood of Jesus Christ, I call that person forth in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, and by the favor of God, you have access unto it today in Jesus' name. For those in real estate business, may the favor of God come upon you such that you in covenant with God by an arrangement to help people own homes, own apartments, 
And that becomes the desire, the compassion that you have for humanity. With that as the covenant that you have with your God, you shall never run dry of finances to build. And your company shall grow and multiply and shall be one of the strongest in whichever nation that you are in, in the domain of real estate, by reason of this grace that has entered into you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. Hallelujah.